All right, everybody, welcome. Uh, this is the Sailing World's, uh, we're kind of loosely calling it around the world, a chance to check in with all of our COVID friends confined in different parts of the world and uh, just a chance to find out what's going in the various parts of the country and tell some stories and uh, wing it, as we say. So um, I, I guess, uh, I'm not sure if the, the names show up on, the, on the, uh, the cast here, but we'll go top left. We've got Steve Hunt on my left and I'm in the middle, Chris Snow, upper right, below him, Ed Baird. Uh, Tony Ray in the middle, Gary Jobson, uh, we call that middle left, John McKee at the bottom, and Dave Paulson, our contributing uh, editor, probably been at this longer than I have, in the middle, and uh, Taylor and Steph Robel uh, down there, bottom right, checking in from Miami. <clears throat> All right, so um, who wants to go first? I mean, let's, let's talk with, uh, I guess, Steve, you're, you're up the earliest on the West Coast there. Uh, what's happened in San Diego? Well, we're pretty much on full lockdown. Uh, you know, it's slowly been more and more each day and each week. And uh, we just got an email from the Yacht Club that said, no more boating on San Diego Bay. And uh, all the parks are closed. Mission Bay closed down last week. Uh, There's no surfing, no sailing. Uh, there was one little dirt track that I would take the boys to that no one knew about. It's not public land, but they figured that one out and shut that down yesterday as well. So, Pretty much full lockdown here. <laughs> full confinement. Nah. So you, um, you want to talk quick on high school sailing because uh, you've uh, coached a string of national championship teams. And uh, I've got a couple teenagers here. I'm miserable that they're, they're missing their senior sports year. And um, you were mentioning something about this, uh, this kid that had an outstanding high school career has kind of come up short. I mean, what's, uh, what is the impact for these kids? Yeah, it's kind of sad for the kids, you know, it's sad for everybody with all the regattas canceling, but uh, we have something special going on here at Point Loma, and, you know, the Mallory Trophy is the fleet racing championship in high school, it's been going on since 1930, and uh, when you look through the list, a lot of teams have won it twice, there's a small amount of teams that have won it three times in a row, and uh, we, we happen to be lucky enough to be one of those teams, we just won it the last three years in a row, and uh, all the kids on the team that have won it are seniors. And so we were really excited to try to win it for the fourth time, which would be a record. And Jack Egan, uh, the best kid on the team, probably the best kid I've ever coached. Uh, he has a great story. As, as a freshman, he went to MIT where the Nationals were. And he was in B division. And he, he won his division there and won the national championship as a freshman. So he's 14, 15 years old. And, you know, MIT, if you've ever been there, is super shifty and crazy place. And a funny story from there, or let me back up. My, my method of coaching him is don't coach him. I mean, he's better than me. He's smarter than me. I learned early on, just let him, hand him a bottle of water and let him go sailing. And he wins. He's probably won 98% of the regattas he's done since I've been coaching him. And I, he was good when he showed up. And so in MIT, it was so shifty. And we said, okay, green light attack whenever you want. You know, it's 30, 40 degree shifts. But every once in a while, you get a little 10 or 20 degree shift and it comes right back. Five seconds later, so if you tack and tack right back, uh, you might lose a little bit. So I said, you know, Jack, just maybe try to figure out if it's the real one or not. He goes, Coach, don't worry about it. I got it figured out. My crew and I, we call that fake news. Honey <laughs> Trump had just been elected. And uh, again, I was like, okay, don't coach this kid. He not only thought what I thought, but put a cool name to it. So in the oscillating breeze, that, that little tiny shift that comes right back that you shouldn't have tacked on, he's like, that's fake news. We sell through that and tack on the big ones. So he won his division the next year in Texas, B division, and then his best friend graduated. And then his junior year, he switched to A division in Seattle last year, and he won his division there as well. So he's won the Nationals three years in a row and won his division. And so we just found out the high school Nationals were canceled this year, which was a bit of a bummer. But uh, I think on the bright side, you know, as sailors, we try to – only worry about the things that we can control. And uh, we work really hard every time we go to practice. And, <clears throat> and they, all my top kids realize that we can't really control this. And they've worked their butts off. And it is what it is. So I just, I just texted the top three kids the other day and uh, said, you know, Dennis Conner made fun of me one time for winning a Etchell's World Championships when the next one was six months out. He said, pretty short time to be a champ. So I text the kids, hey, look, you won the national championship and you did the opposite of what I did. The next one's two years from now. 
So at least we can be proud of everything we've done and you're the champs for two years. Nice. Where is Jack headed to next? He's going to go to Yale. Yeah. yeah. Really excited for that. He's super excited. <clears throat> Ed's, Ed's son went there, right? Yeah, he did. Yeah. Uh, it's a great, great experience there. He really enjoyed it. Great. Yeah, I think this guy, Jonathan McKee, went there too, right? <laughs> nice. Nice. Oh, that's cool. Well, uh, I hope we talked about maybe we'll have him on a guest one day and pick his brain and find out what makes him uh, makes him fast. Well, that'd be great. When I have him speak speak as much as I can at practice, and he's brilliant, so that would be awesome. Nice, Gary. Was he uh, one of your jobs in juniors not that long ago? Wasn't he? He was when we were doing that. We had a good year, a good run. I think twelve years in a row, we had the jobs in juniors. Mr. Baird's son was there, if I recall. He's got a way of picking them. Nice. So, uh, so yeah, so that was a bit of their last race. So we, we want to talk about this topic of uh, you're only as good as your last race. I guess it was your last championship. Um, so uh, we got um, – who wants to go first? And we're talking about uh, Steph had a little bit of a nail-biter of a, of a race um, to talk about, and then Ed wants to share one too. Uh, which one of you guys wants to, wants to chime in? Ladies first, please. <laughs> <laughs> this will be our first attempt at screen share, so hopefully this goes – goes well so I think uh what I've got to do is I'm going to give you maybe uh host I'm going to make you the host you guys are in charge oh boy <laughs> you have it on your yeah you can click her screen and I think hit the pin button pin video and it'll make it larger I think I just emailed you the link yeah all right there you go all right you are larger <laughs> all right do you have yours or do you want oh I think it's your turn yeah, can you? I think she emailed it to you, Dave. Yeah. Can you play it from yours? Yep, I can do it. Uh, let's see. Uh, yep. Oops. So we're just tuning yeah. into a replay of the lured mark of the medal race at the 2020 World Championship in Geelong, Australia. Um, it was a race where everything was kind of on for us um, for the – um, for podium position at the Worlds and also for the Olympic trials. So you can see here, um, well, I'll just let it play through and you can kind of witness the carnage for yourself. Um, that's us there, USA 50 um, with the yellow spinnaker. Um, and as this plays out, you can see the fleet is just, it's, it's full carnage. And, um, you know, it's, I think it's just a testament to how hard these boats are to sail. It's, it's blowing 20, 22 knots in this moment. And, um, it was just, it was all on for the fleet. Um, you can see the Spanish here in the bottom of the screen do a nice little thread the needle move um, with all these boats coming into the gate at the same time. Um, so yeah, our, our, our specific situation coming into this, um, I think it all set up at the windward mark for us. Um, we rounded the windward mark second behind Paris Nana, who were um, the American team that we were fighting with for the U.S. Olympic trials. Um, Maggie and I had a, we had a really good bear away and Maggie, my crew just ripped the spinnaker up and we were able to kind of set up to lure it in behind Paris and Anna. So we were able to control the jive point um, later on in the run. And the Germans here were in third um, after the lured mark, but they had jived early, um, came for this right hand turn. We had to duck them. Um, and soon after the duck, Maggie went for the takedown and I accidentally dug the wing of our boat into the water, which caused us to nearly capsize. And I don't think we've ever fought as hard as we did for saving a capsize as we did in that moment. I mean, Maggie was like full Tarzan mode, just like hanging off her trapeze wire, just giving everything she could to save it. Um, and actually like usually we hang off like the, um, the trapeze handle, but she came out from taking the kite down flew out onto the wire, grabbed the actual hook of the, of the trapeze line. Instead of the, the handle, she grabbed the hook. It was like hanging with everything she could to try to get the boat back on its feet. And, and ultimately we did. And I mean, as you can see here, it's a total, um, total chaos at the Lord Mark. And we, you know, but we kind of, we thank our coach for having us practice a lot of crazy boat handling drills, which I think saved us in this situation and um, allowed us to go on to win this medal race. It's cool. Uh, so real quick, if you were the, uh, the Spaniards there, um, how, how would you have just ripped through that chaos there? Was just, you just, in this kind of boat, you just send it and kind of hope for the best? 
yeah, I think exactly that. You gotta just send it. Sometimes you maybe even close your eyes and just go for it. <laughs> you know, it's it's pretty full on. And I, watching the Spanish thread the needle there is very impressive. And she was the match racing gold medalist from 2012, and she just absolutely nailed it. And I think it's you know it shows that she's a really good match racer and a really good fleet racer and good at boat handling. That's awesome. Um, so you, you got, you got a year to kind of think through that one and, um, yeah, yeah, we have some time now. Um, so we're just trying to figure out how we can stay productive while, you know, being onshore sailors at the moment. So a lot of gym time, a lot of kind of tactics focused talks and, um, reviewing the GPS trackers and video and, um, yeah, just trying to be as productive as we can be right now. Mm -hmm. And you got an in-house coach? Yeah, right here. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. This is definitely the most nervous I've ever been during a sailboat race was watching <laughs> that race. So it's pretty cool to see them, uh, you know, prevail in a tough situation. That's cool. Um, all right. So we'll keep going uh, here. So we got our time limit. So, um, Ed, let's sort of tee yours up. Um, I'm going to share. I've got Ed's here. Let's see. Uh, uh oh, I had it. Nope. Yeah, there's cancel that well while you're thinking about it i'll sort of tee up the concept if you can hear me can you hear me yeah, i can hear yeah you. yeah okay so you know we're in cape town with the 52s this is race five out of the seven that we ended up having down there um and and a lot of the teams had local knowledge coaches and our local knowledge coach this morning uh told us that you know, it was going to be a weird day, but for sure that we would not be sailing in a 300 wind direction. And here we are starting the race. The weather mark was set at 300 exactly. <laughs> um, so nobody knows what's going to happen. All we saw was that the wind had been shifting right and then it stopped shifting. So we decided to start left of the fleet looking for it to just pull back a little bit. And uh, it ended up working out. Um, you can see Table Mountain in the background there. We're, we're just off the line in a, in a pretty comfortable position underneath a couple of boats with a good gap to lure it of us. We got out on that left-hand side and, and slowly, I mean, we were probably two minutes from ley line and, and we had a maybe eight or 10 degree header. Uh, so into the 290-ish sort of range. And um, when we tacked, we started getting 280s and then 275 and, it just, there was just a little bit better pressure. And uh, as we all got to the weather mark, um, the, the boats that had come in from that left side uh, were pretty strong. We rounded, and you see us just going around here. It was it, literally it, every length that you went farther left was two lengths that you gained on the boats that tacked early. Um, it was an amazing, you know, just slow build from that side. We also had, um, uh, like 18 knots at the top of the mast, but we were sailing with sails that you would race with in, in 10 or 11 knots. Uh, on the water, it was nowhere near as much wind as there was up at the top. So uh, sail trim had to be changed. Everything was adjusted. We, we got around just in front now, and now's the scary part. You know, what's going to happen down this run? We're in this 275 wind direction. Is it going to go back to 300? Uh, if so, going straight's okay. Or is it going to keep going? Is it going to go to 250? Um, you could look over to the left side of the picture, the right side of the picture now, uh, and you could see about 500 yards away, there was, uh, you know, five knots more breeze and about 25 degrees left shift. Uh, but you couldn't get there, and it wasn't coming any closer. So it was a really scary run. Actually, the whole race was scary because it just, the breeze was dying. Um, it was getting more unstable. And, uh, so what do you defend? Do you defend your side of the course? Do you defend the next boat behind you? Uh, there's a lot of talking about it and we, we decided that we just wanted to stick with the people next to us. So we all jived about the same time here and got going across the center of the course. And fortunately for us, that, that breeze never filled in from the table mountain side of things. And, um, you know, we, we got going down the middle of the course. The boat handling was uh, spectacular as it generally is with these teams. They're, they're really uh, amazing boats to sail and the, the guys that sail them are, are terrific. You know, they just, they're working hard together. 
every every uh, maneuver is is well choreographed. Uh, you know, you see the jibes. The jibe in, in 10 or 11 knots like this is totally different than it is in 20 knots or 25 like we had the next day. Uh, pretty good fun. You can see the sky up there above us is changing, so we know something's going to happen, but none of us are really confident with what. So now we're just playing the game. Stay between where you're going and the next boat. This is always amazing. People love to watch the drops on these boats, and they are really impressive. The spinnaker comes down in just a couple of seconds and is totally inside the boat. Everybody gets free to get up on the rail and start hiking right away after the mark. Now, again, here's a critical moment in the race. You know, do you sail high and make the boat behind you tack, or do you go straight and try to keep them there because you're not sure what's going to happen next? You know, these are all little things that have to be considered, and this race course was – anything but straightforward. Fortunately, the fleet was well behaved and generally sailed in the same area. We didn't have anybody splitting to tremendous uh, distances away and, and it worked out fairly well for us. But uh, tricky, scary, there's all sorts of stuff. There's current, um, you know, you see the big ships that are nearby that we, we had to not get too close to those to, to lose breeze. There was just lots going on down here. Amazing place to sail. Uh, I think in a, in a week or two, when we do this again, we're going to have another video of uh, sailing downwind and 28, 30 knots of breeze and the water coming over the bow. It, it was seriously cold water. <laughs> you really knew about it when, uh, when it filled up your, uh, your foul weather gear. But this day, um, you know, we ended up going downwind again in, the, in a similar wind direction. Every, every leg had a course change. Um, so there was, it was definitely shifting, but it wasn't shifting – big amounts. We get down to the bottom here on this leg and, uh, and we finish the race and literally two minutes, maybe three minutes after the last boat finished, uh, the bay glassed off and there was no more wind. So, uh, you know, that was the end of the day. The, the race committee did a great job to use every bit of it. So, Ed, you have this uh, stand-up style here. Well, for the hoist, yeah, you got you to gotta stand up for the hoist um, so you can see everything. You got to see over the guys. You got to see when the buoy is coming. Um, and then downwind and, and this wind speed, standing up helps you to just feel the boat a lot better than sitting down. When it gets windy, you got to sit down because the boat will just throw you all over the place. Yeah. As, uh, as, you know, as, as these boats have evolved and in, in, in as the helmsman, you get pushed further and further into the boat, is, has that been – kind of a long-term thing to get used to by being surrounded by more bodies, more chatter, or is it sort of feel more natural? Well, I think, you, you know, as a driver, you stand where you can to make, to, so that you see what you need to and you can hear what you need to. And, and uh, I mean, this is the same sort of position that I'd be in in a pre-start, you know, when I have to maneuver the boat and, and get around. Um, the windier it gets, the, the more pressure is on the tiller and the more the, 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 the action of the boat throws you around and you got to sit down. So, um, you know, it's really just feeling your way on all that. One of the most interesting things is when it gets really smoky, windy, and you go downwind, the, uh, the driver is the forward most person on the boat. Everybody stands behind you. It's really hard to hear, and you are blocking all the waves for everybody. So that, that whole thing about being in the afterguard and being dry, not anymore. <laughs> it's only fair. Yeah. Does anybody have a question for Ed, uh, Ed on this one? Or, I mean, it uh, looks like fun. We all we love, the, I love the chance to come race you guys sometime. So, got a couple of people on this call that probably love to jump in at any point. Well, they're a terrific class, and, and you got to thank Quantum for letting us use this video to, to show how it all goes. We appreciate it. After looking at that video, I think the America's Cup would do well in boats like that. Just maybe an 80 foot version of that. I think you are far from being alone in that view. Because that's pretty exciting stuff with all the crew work and the that spinnaker takedown was a thing of beauty. Yeah, it's good fun. I mean, it is, it's terrific racing and, uh, and the teams are, are awesome. And um, it's close and exciting. And everybody that comes along as a guest on the days uh, goes home saying that was amazing. So uh, good fun. So real quick, uh, it seemed like the, the party stopped in Cape Town after this event. What, or it's, uh, boats and what's, uh, everything sits in containers until somebody pulls the trigger and it starts again, or what happens? Yeah, right now we've been uh, – our next two events have been canceled, and um, 
we, we don't know when the season's going to start again. And obviously this is something that's far down the list in terms of uh, uh, things that are going to get opened back up. We've got to have people going back to work and being safe and healthy before we can ever go out and, and play sailboat racer again. But um, hopefully we'll get that opportunity sooner rather than later. Yeah. So uh, there's, there's quite a few pros out there uh, twiddling their thumbs. This might be a good point for Tony to check in here with um, the other day you were telling us about this, um, I call it, it's kind of a pro sailing coaching union um, that you guys, you guys are cooking up. Yeah, no, I'm happy to, happy to chat about it. You know, unfortunately the timing is good to talk about it and I uh, certainly wish it wasn't, but um, you know, the first thing I want to say is just, you know, it's, it's pretty cool being on this page with all these incredible sailors, young, middle-aged, old, they're all here. It's awesome to see. And it's a, uh, it's a privilege to be a part of it. Um, you know, I've been so fortunate to be a player in this sport, either a sailor or a coach for so long. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, I've been struck at how, as I, as I've aged up in the sport and been able to do all these different cool races and, and being a, a, a pro sailor and a coach as to who influenced me in my career and who gave me my start, gave me a chance to come out and do all this. Uh, and how are we then providing for the coaches and making it easy for them to do that in, uh, you know, going, going forward and helping to grow our sport. And I was really inspired by Steve Hunt's story when we started this off. Um, you know, I want to talk to Jack Egan in 10 years and go, Jack, tell me what it was like to have, you know, Steve Hunt is your coach. And Steve's a pretty humble guy, but I guarantee you he does a lot more than just hand him a water bottle. And that influence is probably the most important piece of our sport going forward. And it's, uh, if we're committed to trying to grow what we do and share what we do, then we've got to take care of the people that are going to go out and do that. Um, so about a year ago, I joined the board of directors of U.S. Sailing because I decided I didn't have enough, uh, you know, on my plate. So, so it's been great. It's been rewarding. Um, I've had my eye open as to how much U.S. Sailing actually does. And so a big part of me being there is to try to create this um, uh, association. What we're calling it for now is, uh, is uh, Association of Sailing Professionals, which is to include coaches and pro sailors. Um, but really what we're trying to do is legitimize the career path for the sailing professional. We want to do is make it easier for the coaches uh, of, of, any, of any point in their career to stay in, to continue to do what they do and then influence all the, uh, all the sailors that are, that are coming behind us. You know, it's sort of the primary objective of U.S. sailing is to grow the sport. And to me, fostering those coaches is the best way to do it. So, so we're doing this thing. It's going to take a while. Um, sort of watch the space kind of thing. Uh, we're not quite sure exactly what form it's going to take. But generally speaking, we're going to form the sort of legal basis of the association in order to provide uh, health benefits, sort of health care, um, ins different insurance products, some form of a retirement product you can pay into, um, have a code of ethics that all the coaches and sailors will sign into, and then some uh, ongoing uh, standards and practices, sort of advice on uh, legal side, Jones Act, accounting, um, uh, financial planning, all the things that are going to allow young coaches um, uh, to stay in our sport give them that legitimate career path so they can go, okay, this is something I want to do. So what we're trying to do is capture the passionate ones, the talented ones, and, uh, and, and keep them in the sport so we can get the, you know, these incredible coaches like, like you know, Steve Hahn here. And I know uh, Ed Baird's had a whole uh, fantastic career of not just being a world-class sailor, but also a coach and teacher. Um, that's the most important thing we can be thinking about. And so, you know, this situation right now is obviously it's a, it's more than unsettling. We'll use the word unsettling for a lot of reasons. Um, and so we we're taking it as an opportunity to try to kind of um, gather the coaches together and the pro sailors and go, okay, you know, who do we want to be in our sport? How can we help um, the people around us, How, help everybody stay engaged? So when it is time to go sailing, we can all get back on the water and do what we love. You know, we're, we're more than just, you know, professionals. We're stewards of the sport you know, and, and all of us are, it's not just the, it's not just the pros, the amateurs too, because we're stewards of it. We got to leave it better than how we found it. So this, this for the, the formation of the association is trying to be a small part of that. So like I said, I can't provide a whole lot more details because we're still working it out in real time, but um, so sort of watch the space and happy to give you updates as we go. Cool. All right. So we've uh, hit our six, uh, we got six minutes remaining. So let's check in with the uh, 
we'll do a quick run through. Uh, Jonathan out in the uh, Pacific Northwest, you guys are kind of where all this uh, COVID stuff started. You Hopefully the numbers are down, but what, what are you doing to stay busy out there? <clears throat> yeah, it's an interesting time. Um, yeah, we certainly uh, had it, uh, f- you know, before most of the country here in Seattle. And hopefully that means that we'll get over it sooner as well, but we'll see how it goes. Um, it's a little bit ambiguous of whether it's really legit to go sailing or not. Um, they haven't actually closed down the boat ramps and the beaches. And so then it kind of hinges on, do you consider it essential or not? <laughs> so for myself, uh, you know, keeping sane, uh, maybe that is uh, essential. And so I've, and most of uh, our, the other dinghy sailors in Seattle have decided that as long as we stay apart from each other when we're rigging and de-rigging and, you know, don't get too close on the water that we, it's okay to go sailing, dinghy sailing. So, um, up to now, it's been mostly on the Arrow. Um, we got a pretty good fleet here in Seattle. So that's been really good. We've actually gotten a lot better. <laughs> and then yesterday, we, uh, my wife Libby and I sailed the Tazar um, for the first time in six months. It was an old fleet boat that um, I spent the last couple of weeks fixing up. And so got it going. And uh, so it was a really cool day. It was northerly, about 15 knots, and just perfect sailing. So we had five tasers out on Puget Sound, and it was just a really awesome day. We all came back with smiles on our face. And, you know, it, to have some, some things that you can look forward to in life when the rest of it's kind of boring is, is good. You know, so are you uh... – it's kind of staging off the beach one at a time on the air. It's sort of that you're not all launching, you know, at once. Yeah, we um, we actually launched from a big float um, at Shell Shell. So people are pretty well separated. That part's not really a problem. Um, cool. So the logistics of it are fine. It's more like I'm a little concerned about the public perception and, you know, being accused of, um, you know, breaking the quarantine or whatever. You know, I think what we're doing is safe and we're not infecting anyone, but, you know, also trying to not send the wrong message. Yeah, I hear that. Cool. One uh, thing that has been pretty interesting that's come out of this um, is, you know, rather than sit around after sailing and talk about it and debrief um, in real, you know, together in person, um, we've started doing these email debriefs. Um, so we have one thread going for the Arrow fleet and we're starting another one for the Tazars. Um, and that's been really great. It actually has forced people to, um, you know, be a little bit more rigorous about, you know, what they're doing, what their settings were, what they're thinking about. And so we've, um, kind of developed this, uh, accidentally this, this really solid, um, debrief method that you can use for as many boats as there are. Cool. Um, so I want to, uh, is before we run out of time, give, uh, maybe a minute to Chris, a minute to Gary, kind of check in from you. And then we'll, I think, well, you guys had some ideas that we can, um, do this again soon or do, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we have to figure out how often we want to do this. And, uh, Taylor's got some stuff to show out of the sale GP, um, experience. And I got a lot of questions for him. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll, uh, let's take the next couple of minutes, just kind of check on everybody. And then, um, do this again and, and dive deeper into a few topics. That all sound cool. All right. So, uh, Gary, real quick, uh, you went sailing, but now you can't go sailing in Annapolis. Um, what do you think? Hey, bummer. I mean, right now it's blowing 12 or 13 knots. The sun's out. It's 65 degrees. It'll be a perfect afternoon to take my boat for a sail. But there's been a lot of pressure put on the uh, governor and the Department of Natural Resources to allow some kind of recreational boating even if it's got some restrictions to it, it would be okay. And curiously, he's allowed fishing to go on and charter fishing boats to go out, but not the sailboats. Can you fish off the sailboats? going around and people are angry and hopefully uh, that gets relaxed here in the near future. Can you put a pole out the back and say you're fishing? Well, I got, I'm going to get a bamboo rod and a, you know, a string and a bucket and say I'm going fishing. That, that, you know, I got to get a fishing license. Probably cost me 10 bucks for that, and that'll be my reason. All right, cool. 
Um, so the two minute mark, uh, Chris, you, you mentioned that you're working with USA sailing in a way to um, get the one design classes, I think better, better connected. So we'll, uh, we can check on that one next time if that's cool. Absolutely. Just anecdotally, one of the side effects of the uh, quarantining that's happening, at least in uh, certainly in California, is that the uh, we're seeing that the air pollution here has gone way, way down. The sky is much clearer. And uh, anecdotally, we are noticing, much to our chagrin, that the sea breezes are actually stronger than they normally are this time of year. It's kind of an interesting phenomenon, which is certainly frustrating as well. Cool. All right. Well, um, before we run out of time, Taylor, you're on the hook for the next one. So we'll tee you up. Uh, Dave, thanks for listening in. Um, well, it's been fun. And uh, you guys are game. We'll keep doing it. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, right, Dave. Thank, Thank you. you. Stay healthy, everybody. <laughs>